Hello there, Mr. Sutton here, bringing you the Precal Honors 3-6 lesson on features of rational functions. In this one, we will be identifying intercepts, asymptotes, and holes of rational functions. For our warm-up, we'll take a look at the simplest rational function out there, f of x equals 1 over x. Pause the video and take a sec to graph this. For your graph, you should have come up with two branches, one down here and one up here, like so. Now we can see from this graph that we're not touching either the y or the x-axis. Um, so if I ask you to fill in this blank, y, rational functions always sometimes or never have x or y intercepts, clearly they do not always have x and y intercepts. But now let's think about what creates these different types of intercepts. For a y-intercept, that's just wherever the uh, graph equals 0 for the x value. Now here, if you plug in 0, um, clearly that's not going to give you any kind of value. But let's say this was x minus 2 down here. Then plugging in 0 would give you a number. So these can sometimes have y-intercepts. Now for x-intercepts, you need to find a way to make the uh, top, the numerator here, 0, because you'd basically be setting y equal to 0 and solving for that. Um, so if there's something up here like x minus 2 that you can set equal to 0, then you could have an x-intercept as well. So sometimes they have these intercepts, sometimes they don't. Now one thing that most rational functions have that's kind of hidden on this graph, because the uh, y and the x-axis are kind of in the way, if we were to remove those axes, we would see that there are these nice little dashed guidelines here called asymptotes. Now there's two types of asymptotes in this graph. One of these, the vertical asymptote, or VA for short, that's a vertical line, in other words, an X value, that the graph is approaching, but never touches. And the reason it never touches this graph, if you look at the X value 0, you're going to have 1 over 0 if you plug in 0 for X. Your graph's never going to touch it because the function is undefined at that X value. Now this is a little bit different from a horizontal asymptote, or HA for short. This is a horizontal line, in other words, a Y value that the graph is approaching as X gets either very positive, so moving to the far right, or very negative, moving to the far left. Now because horizontal asymptotes are caused by end behavior and not by something being defined or undefined, with a horizontal asymptote, you can sometimes cross one of those. Um, another, there's another graph I can think of right now that kind of goes up and down and up and down, but a little bit less as you move to the far right. Um, so that's an, a clear one where you're sometimes crossing it. Now there's a third type of asymptote, sort of, and you'll see why I say sort of here. If we look at this rational function here, we have this slanted asymptote, which is actually what it's called, slant asymptote, or SA for short. Um, sometimes you'll see them called oblique asymptotes. It's the same thing, though. This is just a slanted version of a horizontal asymptote. A slant asymptote is also caused by end behavior, not by anything being undefined. So like the horizontal asymptote, it is theoretically possible for the graph to sometimes cross the slant asymptote. Now, if you take a close look at this graph, there's one more feature you might notice. Down here in the lower left, there's this little open dot here. That is actually called a hole. Or sometimes, uh, in calculus fancy speak, we call this a removable discontinuity. Um, but that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. This is just a single point where the function is undefined. So it's similar to a vertical asymptote in that it's caused by the function being undefined somewhere. Um, but it's a little bit different if you take a look at how it's affecting the graph. With this vertical asymptote, the graph is changing and hugging the asymptote. It's, it's altering direction because of this force of nature that is the vertical asymptote. Down here, this is just kind of like a pothole in the road that, I mean, you might see it or you might not. You just run over it with your car, and, and there's a little bump, but otherwise the graph is unaffected by it. We're going to start doing some analysis now. We'll start by tackling the x and the y-intercepts of this rational function. Now before we do anything else, I like to always factor and cancel whatever I can. So pause the video and take a moment to do that here. Alright, so for my factorization, 
Up top, I needed two things that multiply to negative 12 and add up to negative 4. That would be x plus 2 and x minus 6. And in the denominator, this can split up into x plus 6 and x minus 6. X plus, or x minus 6's rather, are going to cancel, leaving us with x plus 2 over x plus 6. So I've got two versions of this function. I've got this simplified version down here, and I've got the original. And they're actually both going to be useful in different situations. Finding the x-intercepts, I'm just asking, where does y equal 0? Because y equals 0 all over the x-axis, right? Um, so I'm just trying to zero out the whole fraction. But to zero out a whole fraction, I just have to zero out the numerator. So I'm just going to set x plus 2 equal to 0, and then solve for x, giving me x equals negative 2. Now, notice I used the simplified function to do this, not the original. If I used the original and factored it and set each of these equal to 0, I also would have gotten x equals 6 as an x-intercept. But 6 can't be an x-intercept because the graph is actually undefined at 6. It gives us a 0 in the denominator. Um, so this is why we just want to use the simplified form for x-intercepts. How about for y-intercepts? Well, the y-intercept, we're just asking, where does x equal 0? So for this, we just plug x 0 in for x. But where do I do that? Do I do it in the simplified form or the original? We're going to go ahead and do it in the original. And I'll explain why in just a sec, but let's go ahead and do it and see what we get. So zeroing out everything with an x, we just end up with negative 12 over negative 36, which we can reduce to 1 third. Now the question is, would I have gotten a different answer by plugging 0 into the simplified form? On this problem, no. You would have gotten 2 over 6, which still reduces to 1 third. But sometimes, plugging 0 in for x would actually zero out everything in the numerator and denominator in the original but not in the simplified form. Um, so to make sure you're catching that and realizing when your y-intercept doesn't actually exist, you really do need to plug this into the original function. The next feature of rational functions we'll look at is vertical asymptotes and the closely related holes. Now these are both examples of something called a discontinuity, um, which is a big calculus concept. The basic idea with these we're looking for where f of x is undefined, where there's a break of some sort in the graph. So again, you'll want to factor this. You'll want to cancel out whatever you can. And now, since both holes and vertical asymptotes happen where the function is undefined, we have to ask, how can we tell the difference between the two algebraically? A hole is an undefined that we can cancel out. So we just set this uh, x minus 6 equal to 0, and x equals 6 is the location of a hole. Now, if we wanted to find the y value of that hole, then we could actually plug this back in to the simplified function, and we would figure out the hole point here. Um, no pun intended. Um, but for, for now, we just want the x value. Now, a vertical asymptote, in contrast, that's an undefined x value that you cannot cancel out. So if you look at the simplified function, and this is another reason that we simplify these things and cancel things out, if we do x plus 6 equals 0, if we set this denominator equal to 0 and solve, we get a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 6. Now holes in calculus, we call those removable discontinuities because you can actually remove them from the function if you wanted to. Vertical asymptotes, on co in contrast, are called infinite discontinuities because, among other reasons, you cannot remove them. And now for my favorite feature of rational functions, horizontal asymptotes. I really like this one because a lot of students don't realize it when they do these, um, but they're actually doing calculus-level reasoning. So for a horizontal asymptote, because these are caused by end behavior, the way we're going to figure out what's happening to the function as we get really positive or really negative is going to be by looking at which side has the higher exponent. In the short term, if you have small x values, having a bigger exponent down here or up here, or having the same level exponent, won't really necessarily make a huge difference. But as this x value gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the side that has the higher exponent is going to start to dominate the fraction. 
So this idea of dominance is going to give us three different cases. The first case is where you have a bottom-heavy fraction, a higher uh, exponent in the denominator. And in those cases, as this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, your denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if your denominator keeps getting bigger, I mean, think about it, one-half, one-tenth, one-millionth, what's happening to the value of the whole fraction? It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as a whole number. So that means that your asymptote, the number you're approaching, as this gets larger and larger, you're going to be getting closer and closer to zero. Um, so automatically, if you have a bottom-heavy fraction, your horizontal asymptote is zero, automatically. Now, what if we have the same degree? Well, in this case, what's going to happen, as you plug in bigger and bigger and bigger x values, these other terms over here aren't really going to matter as much. I mean, if this was 3 billion and this was 4 billion down here, it doesn't really matter as, as a big picture if you have this little plus 1 or this minus 5. You're really just looking at those billions places. Um, so in this case, all you're going to do is just take the ratio of your lead coefficients. If this is basically 3 billion and 1 over 4 billion minus 5, the number that this is approaching is, is essentially 3 over 4. So this can be different depending on what your lead coefficients are. Bottom heavy, it's always 0. Same, same degree, uh, it's going to depend on your coefficients. Our last case here is top heavy. And if we think about what's happening here, if your numerator keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then your fraction just keeps growing in size without any kind of bounds. So in this case, you're not going to have any horizontal asymptote. Does this mean you don't have any asymptote? No, it does not. It means you have something called a slant asymptote. So let's take a look at that now. We'll continue that example 5 here. Um, with a slant asymptote, to figure out what that's going to be, you actually just have to divide the numerator by the denominator. And as it turns out, we have a nice method of dividing here. Uh, we'll just use synthetic division. So we've got the 1 for the x squared. We'll have a 0 in here because there's no x term, no linear term, so we need a placeholder. And then we have this 5 over here. And we're dividing that by x plus 2. So that means our box number is just going to be negative 2. So bring down the 1 times negative 2 plus 0 times negative 2 plus 5. Turns out this last one isn't going to matter at all, but we'll put it in there for accuracy's sake. So now your slant asymptote is just going to be the quotient after this division. So this 1 really stands for 1x. We've got a minus 2. And there is this remainder of 9, um, but it turns out that we can just ignore this. Because again, slant asymptotes are caused by long-run behavior. They're caused by plugging in really positive or really negative values of x. So if this is, like again, a billion, this little remainder 9 is not going to make a huge difference. So our slant asymptote for this is just going to be y equals this line right here. For our wrap-up, we're going to tackle a problem that has you put it all together. So for this one, pause the video and find all intercepts, asymptotes, and holes. All right, let's see how you did. So let's start by factoring. We can take out an x from the numerator, leaving us with x minus 8. Denominator, we need two things multiplying to negative 16 and adding up to negative 6. That's x plus 2 and x minus 8. x minus 8s can cancel. So we just have x over x plus 2, then, for the simplified function. All right, let's find all these different things. So for x-intercepts, we just need to set our numerator equal to 0. So just x equals 0. Um, that's the equation and the solution to that equation. 0 is the only x-intercept. For y-intercepts, well, I, I think we know what we're going to end up with. But let's plug in 0 for the x values anyway in the original. So I have 0 up top. On the bottom, I have negative 16, but 0 over negative 16 just comes out to 0. Now, it shouldn't shock us that we have a y-intercept of 0 because we had an x-intercept of 0. This is the origin. The origin is both an x-intercept 
and a Y intercept. Kind of cool. Moving on, let's do the vertical asymptotes. So we're just setting the denominator of the simplified function equal to 0. So if x plus 2 equals 0, x equals negative 2 is a vertical asymptote. For holes, we're looking at common factors that got canceled out and are no longer in the simplified denominator, like this x minus 8. And we're setting those equal to 0 in solving. So we then have a hole at x equals 8. And there's a y value that goes with this. If you really wanted to find the y value, again, we could just plug this number into the simplified function. So this would be 8 over 10, or 4 fifths for the y value that goes with that hole. Moving on to the horizontal asymptotes, we have the same degree, x squared and x squared. We're tied for highest exponent here. So we just take the lead coefficients. That would be 1 over 1. And we can just say then that y equals 1. So that's it for this one. Till next time, Mr. Sutton signing off.